Hello and welcome back. This video was meant to accompany the notes for AP Physics 1, Momentum, Impulse, and Conservation of Momentum Concepts. Please feel free to pause or rewind the video as needed. Section 5.1, Mass Accounting. State the law of conservation of mass. Well, the law of conservation of mass is talking about the idea that the total amount of mass remains constant. So if something happens and two things collide, well, then the masses don't break apart and disintegrate. They simply add up to a greater mass after the fact or the total mass before anything happens equals the total mass after something happens. A closed or isolated system is one in which the objects interact only with each other and other external forces outside the system are not applied. As seen in the ebook, three kilograms of oranges plus one kilogram of oranges obviously adds up to a total of four kilograms of oranges. Total mass is conserved. An open or non-isolated system would be one in which one of the masses does not remain constant. Well, that can be seen, for instance, in nuclear reactions. When a particular nuclear reaction happens, the total mass you start with is not the same as the total mass that you end with. That's because some of the initial masses have been converted into energy. So the final mass is slightly less than the initial mass. That's a very specific case. Um, but a non-isolated system also would refer to one in which the, uh, the mass is not completely conserved. So what is a conserved quantity? It's one in which you have a constant value in an isolated system. Linear momentum. Well, you can describe momentum as the quantity of motion. It's the product of mass and velocity. P is the variable for momentum, and P equals mv. The unit for momentum is kilogram meter per second. The unit for mass is still the kilogram, and the unit for velocity is still meters per second. To say that momentum is a vector, it means momentum is a quantity that has magnitude and direction. Remember, the direction of momentum should always point in the direction of the velocity vector, since mass, the other product of momentum, does not have a vector quantity and a direction. So wherever the velocity points, the momentum points the same way. What does it mean for systems of an object to be isolated so that momentum can be conserved? This has to do with the fact that the isolated system of objects only interact with each other, meaning they collide or separate, but they only interact with each other, and that no other external forces are acting on that system. As an equation, we can simply write that the momentum before something happens is equal to the momentum after it happens. Before and after refer to before and after a collision or separation. What would conservation momentum look like if an object had a system had three objects? Well, you would just simply deal with the momentum of all three objects before and after collision. Skipping ahead through these examples, we will do these examples in class together. And let's find our way to page six. Section 6.7, collisions, putting it all together. Well, in this section, we're going to put it together between describing the type of collision, a word description of that collision, how the collision relates to the connection of final kinetic energy versus kinet uh, initial kinetic energy, how kinetic energy affects the collision, and how momentum affects the collision. So in an explosion, an explosion would also be a separation. So it doesn't have to necessarily be a literal explosion. It could be something as simple as 
to uh, people on roller skates or ice skates who push off from each other and they go off in different directions. Okay, or it could be a gun firing a bullet. The bullet flies forward, the gun recoils backward. So any separation type of situation is very similar to an explosion. It simply means the objects go in equal and opposite directions. Well, as a word description, the two objects start and use energy to push each other apart. <clears throat> in that situation, the final kinetic energy will always be greater than the initial kinetic energy, and that's because the initial kinetic energy is zero. You're starting from rest. Uh, momentum in this situation is conserved, meaning the final momentum will always equal the initial momentum. An elastic collision is one in which two objects collide and bounce off each other in a way such that the, not only are the momenta equal, but the kinetic energies are equal as well. In fact, we're going to define an elastic collision as one in which momentum and kinetic energy are conserved. Okay, so if the kinetic energy is equal before and after, that is an elastic collision. And you can visualize an elastic collision as two objects that bounce off each other, but it's not always going to be elastic just if they bounce off each other. That's a good visual, but it's not a hardcore definition. A more proper definition would be relating kinetic energy before and after. The momenta is also conserved. So final momentum still equals initial momentum. How about an inelastic collision? Well, this is one in which two objects could collide and possibly bounce off in a way where the kinetic energy is not conserved. The kinetic energy after the collision is less than the kinetic energy before the collision. This would be one in which you lose that mechanical energy. What would you lose it to? Well, it might be lost to heat given to the surrounding air to increase the internal energy of the air around it. It could be lost to the air in terms of sound waves propagating through the air. The point is, we have a loss of mechanical energy, so we have a reduction in kinetic energy. And so the final kinetic energy will end up being less than the initial energy. The momenta, however, is still conserved. So final momentum still equals initial momentum. Now, a totally inelastic collision is a very specific case. This would be one in which two objects collide. However, they collide and stick together. The momenta are equal, as we see here. But as we saw in the previous case of inelastic collisions, the kinetic energy is not the same. And there is a loss in mechanical energy, and the final kinetic energy is less than the initial kinetic energy. Section 5.3, impulse and momentum. What is the symbol for impulse? Give an equation for impulse. What are the units for impulse, and how do we find it from a graph? Okay. Well, the symbol we're going to use for impulse is the letter J. Okay, J refers to the force applied over a time interval, so it's force times delta T. But it's also equal to a change in momentum. So we can write that as MV final minus MV initial. Note that many textbooks will all write this as just simply delta P. Final momentum minus initial momentum. The units for momentum, for impulse, are the same as for momentum, kilogram meters per second, but it's also going to be a newton second as well. And lastly, we can find impulse by finding the area under a force versus time graph. What does impulse momentum theory say about the relationship between 
impulse and momentum? Well, it's quite simple. Impulse is a change in momentum. And so what it means is we can write the force times the time interval equal to the change in momentum. And this is a very common thing to do and a way to solve that problem. Let's take a few moments to actually derive the impulse momentum theory. First, we start with the definition of acceleration. Okay, so acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. And we use the acceleration from Newton's second law. It's the net force divided by the mass. Since acceleration is the same in both cases, we set them equal to each other. Meaning, we set change in velocity over change in time equal to net force divided by mass. At this point, let's go ahead and get rid of the fraction. And we'll multiply both sides by mass, and we'll multiply both sides by delta t. So we multiply both sides by mass and delta t, which is the time interval of t final minus t initial. Lastly, we can write or rewrite mv final minus mv initial as delta p, and we can rewrite t final minus t initial as delta t. So rewrite change momentum as force times time, force times a change in time. Well, similarly, we can derive the conservation of momentum. First, we start off with a Newton's third law concept. When two objects collide with each other, they oppose, they, they apply an equal but opposite force. So it states that the force exerted on object two is equal and object opposite to the force that two exerts on one. Well, since we're talking about the net force being equal, we're simply using Newton's second law and saying net force equals ma in both cases. So we are replacing force with mass times acceleration. Then what we're going to do is we're going to replace acceleration with change in velocity over change in time. Then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, realize that the time interval is the same in both cases. So we can cancel it. And we no longer have a fraction anymore. What we have is mass times a change in velocity in both cases. What we're going to do at this point is we're going to distribute each mass through parentheses. And lastly, we're going to rearrange the mass and velocities so that all the initial momenta is on the left side and all the final momenta is on the right side. And there we have conservation momentum equation derived. Section 5.7, two-dimensional collisions, putting it all together. Well, when we have two-dimensional collisions, you're simply going to apply the conservation momentum equation in the x and y directions simultaneously and independently. It would look like this. The momentum, the total initial momentum in the x direction equals the total final momentum in the x direction. The total initial momentum in the y direction equals the total, the total final momentum in the y direction. And so what we simply do is we start by writing the whole m1, v1, m2, v2, m1, v1, m2, v2. Start there. Then you can apply your initial in the x direction, initial in the x direction, final in the x direction, final in the x direction. Same thing here with the second equation, initial in the y direction, initial in the y direction, final in the y direction, final in the y direction. By doing so, you simply are accounting for all the possible momenta in all the possible directions, okay, x and y directions. 
if something is only going in the x direction, then you can cancel its y momentum. If it's not moving at all, it has no x nor y momentum. If an object were to collide perfectly inelastically, you would simply take this equation here, and it would be m1 plus m2 times v final. And in both cases, m1 plus m2 times v final in the x direction, and then lastly in the y direction.